Good afternoon. Yes, this is another, another day where we'll be having our seminar presentation. The seminar presentation is based on our theme, re-evaluating archaeological knowledge, the minim uh, minimalist state and regeneration of society in Kenya. So I take this opportunity to welcome our on-site viewers or followers, as well as our online viewers for this presentation. Our speaker for the day is Joseph Ogutu Owino. Joseph will be speaking on football hooliganism in Kenya, the case of AFC Leopards at Golmahia Clubs. Joseph Ogutu Owino is an adjunct lecturer in the Department of History and Archaeology. He is also a PhD candidate in the same department. He holds an MA in history and a BA from, from the same university. His research interest lies more on social history. In his presentation, Ogutu will examine the development of hooliganism in the Kenya's Premier League. He will also argue that hooliganism between Golmahia and AFC Leopards lie in the long-term rivalry and fanaticism, which dates back to the late 1960s and has, uh, uh, when the so-called Mashemeji Dabi was founded. So welcome, Joseph. All right, uh, to the members of staff, our physical and online guests, good afternoon. All right, so uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank you for taking time off to attend this seminar. It's uh, such an honor. So uh, I want to just uh, first begin by giving you a synopsis of how the presentation will unfold uh, is as follows. So, as Ms. Tabitha said, I'm going to present about football hooliganism in Kenya, <clears throat> the case of Gormaya and FC Leopards. And my presentation is as follows. I will start with an introduction of the topic or area of study. Then I will state the problem. And then we'll be following the theoretical framework. And then I'll briefly talk about the sources of data. Then I'll talk about the development of football hooliganism uh, in the case of Gormahia and FC Leopards clubs. And lastly, I'll talk about the responses to hooliganism in terms of the, uh, the efforts that have been made by the KFF and other uh, members of the football fraternity to counter hooliganism in uh, football. So that's uh, the nature of the presentation. All right, uh, so I want to straight away uh, start uh, by talking about the introduction. So I want to define hooliganism, then talk about the origins of football in Europe, uh, specifically in England. And then I'll briefly talk about uh, the beginnings of hooliganism in Kenyan football in the colonial period, and then the case of now Gormai and FC Leopard clubs. So that's the, the sequence of the presentation. So hooliganism is a broad terminology that embodies various types of violent behavior among sport fans. In this study, football hooliganism is defined as a competitive aggressive behavior of both individual and socially planned fan groups primarily targeting rival fan groups. So from that definition, football hooliganism can be both at individual or group levels. And it can be, it's out of uh, the rivalry that develops between uh, fans. The origins of football hooliganism can be located 
within the violent English uh, rituals during the medieval period in Europe. So as early as the medieval period in Europe, uh, when football was in its early days, there were some elements of fights during matches. For example, in the 13th century England, football matches provided a semi-legitimized chance for settling personal grudges and expression of masculine aggression. The usage of the term hooligan originated in England in the 19th century when it was initially used in reference to an individual involved in any sort of disorderly, perhaps a criminal act, more significantly fighting. Now in England, football hooliganism as a concept gained prominence in the mid 1960s, when it was used to describe a person bent on disorderly football related actions. So by 1960s, uh, football hooliganism as a concept had become uh, popular in England, and it was used to make reference to an individual who was engaged in football uh, violence. Now, televising of matches in England in the 1960s exposed acts of hooliganism like riots and pitch invasions to the public. So due to the televising of matches uh, in England in the 1960s, football hooliganism uh, was popularized. So hooliganism, which was initially an English uh, football malady, spread to other parts of Europe in the 1970s, later to South America, Australia, East Asia, South America, and Africa. Well, uh, that explanation can be contested because even in the pre-colonial period in Kenya, we already had some elements of hooliganism reported on a small scale. But the one I'm talking about in terms of being spread from England uh, was through international football contests, right? Especially during the international uh, tournaments like the, uh, for example, World Cup. So through international matches, again, uh, there was that popularization of hooliganism globally. In Kenya, football hooliganism began during the colonial period, mostly in form of indisciplined players attacking each other and all referees during matches with few reported incidences of fan violence. So even before uh, there was a formation of the Kenya National Football League, when people were playing informally or in the regional uh, leagues, for example, uh, in the pre-colonial Kenya people, sorry, in the colonial period, we had football contests which were conducted on a regional basis. And sometimes there could be elements of violence, especially uh, players, indisciplined players attacking referees. But in the colonial period, we have very limited uh, cases of fans engaging in violence during football events, all right? Now, the formation of the Kenya National Football League in 1963 reinforced ethnic and regional rivalry in football, which began during the colonial period and eventually increased hooliganism. This situation was demonstrated by several reported cases of violence in football in the 1960s. For instance, the 1967 Kenya National Football League was marred with hooliganism due to clubs' disregard of referees' decisions. Now, I want to uh, problematize the issue of hooliganism between Gormahia and FC Leopards from that background. So Gormahia and FC Leopards matches sometimes degenerate into sites of physical violence with debilitating outcomes like destruction of property, physical injuries, and in worst cases, deaths. Whenever such incidences occur, the media, the law enforcement officers, and the public at large often generalize their vilification of football fans by calling them hooligans. However, not all fans of FC Leopards and Gormahia 
are violent or for that matter, hooligans as they are often described. Football hooligans are different from normal fans. The former individuals perceive conflicts with the opponent fans as one of their primary goals for attending matches. They ascribe much value by engaging in conflicts than enjoying football matches, which create the platform for it. So at this level, I'm trying to differentiate between uh, the fact that we cannot give a blanket condemnation of fans, whether their teams are known for violence. We have hooligans and just the ordinary fans who watch football for leisure. But the hooligans watch football with intent to harm their rivals. So the latter do not. Now, football hooliganism is an outcome of passionate support for a particular team and abhorrence of a rival team or teams. Uh, this study therefore argues that football hooliganism between Gormai and FC Leopard supporters is a function of their long-term rivalry and fanatism, which began in 1968 when Mashimeji Derby was founded. Uh, the study of hooliganism in this case ends in the first decade of 2000 when commercialization of association, association of football transformed the dynamics of the Mashimeji Derby and subsequently hooliganism. Again, as you shall see uh, in 2000, a number of developments have taken place which have influenced the way people consume football. And all these developments have in one way or another influenced uh, the trends of hooliganism. All right, uh, so I'll maybe uh, demonstrate that at some point. Now, what were my sources of data? Sources of data. So in conducting this uh, study, I have used both uh, secondary and primary data. Now for secondary data, I have specifically used journal articles and books. Uh, so I used journal articles and books to study the general development of football hooliganism in Europe and the theoretical explanations of the same. Again, I collected information on the development of football hooliganism in Kenya through oral interviews and from newspaper articles on hooliganism. And to a large extent, I used uh, the nation, daily nation newspapers because they have a, a good database uh, you know, at the archives. Now, I'm moving to the next step on conceptualization of football hooliganism. So analysis of the development of football hooliganism between Gormaya and FC Lopard's fans is guided by Ramon Spige theoretical framework, which examines the depth of organization of the violent acts and the forms of violent behavior in football. So I've applied Ramon Spige theoretical framework uh, in my analysis of hooliganism between FC Leopards and Gormaya clubs. According to Spige, football hooliganism is a complicated and multifaceted behavior which can take place in various forms and extent before, during, and after matches. So football organism uh, can, be, can happen before a match begins, during the match, and even afterwards. Uh, the serious manifestation of hooliganism is in form of engineered pitch inversions in order to disrupt a match. In a worst scenario, Hooliganism can manifest itself in massive fracas between rival fan groups that are usually aggressive and destructive. Although many fans may be involved in an incident of hooliganism, there are those who do not attend matches with disruptive intent. On the contrary, typical hooligan fans view aggressive behavior and brawls as an integral aspect of attending a match. Acts of hooliganism can be carried out at both individual and group levels, but most of them are attributed to the development of fan groups, especially 
derby support clubs. Like now we are talking about the Mashimeji derby where Gormaya and FC Lopan clubs have their own uh, fan clubs. So football hooligan rivalry can only develop if there is at least one similar rival, individual or group. Again, football hooliganism sometimes takes place in a subtle manner that goes beyond the observable physical violence sensationally reported by the media. For instance, rival fans can express hatred to the opponents through abusive gestures, words, and phrases. So, you know, derogative terms, phrases, you know, uh, that also qualifies to be hooliganism. In terms of organization, football-related violence can either be impulsive or structured, in other words, organized, depending on the prevailing circumstances. So in terms of organization, I've said football hooliganism can be impulsive or organized, depending on the prevailing circumstances. The second approach, the nature of violence has three components. Now, in terms of the nature of uh, violence, uh, it can, how, how does it manifest itself in, in terms of physical violence? Fans violently attacking players and match officials, interfan brawls, and altercations between football fans and police officers. All right, so I'm going to the next uh, stage where I'm going to talk about development of football hooliganism uh, between Gormaya and FC Lopard clubs. So in the course of uh, demonstrating the development of hooliganism, uh, I will actually, uh, you'll see now those theoretical uh, underpinnings of hooliganism in the real case scenario of Gormaya and FC Lopards, right? So I want to now begin with the development of football hooliganism between Gormaya and FC Lopards. Now, in the first two decades of independence, the Nairobi City Stadium was the primary ground for hosting the Kenya National Football League matches. It is at the City Stadium uh, where the rivalry and hooliganism between FC Leopards and Gurbahia was incubated during its embryonic stage. Now, before 1983, the only, uh, uh, it, the city stadium was the primary ground for hosting football uh, uh, events because other stadia had not been constructed, you know? So it was a city stadium. Then 1983, we have Nyo Stadium. Then at 87, we have uh, uh, Kasarani, right? So that's why I'm saying uh, this. And actually, uh, th there is some magic around hooliganism at City Stadium, which I found very interesting. Uh, it is quite, it is more predisposed to hooliganism as compared to this other stadium in the country. Uh, maybe if time allows, I'll be able to explain that. So uh, let me proceed. I'm saying, so I was just saying that. Uh, Hooliganism and rivalry were incubated there. So following the formation of Gormahia in 1968, the Kenya National Football League, which up till then had been dominated by FC Leopards, then known as Abaluya Football Club, became a competition of unnerving intensity, played with the single objective of winning. And by the turn of 1970, Football had become the unofficial religion of most of the Nairobi residences, especially those who lived in Eastland's estates like Kaloleni, Pahati, Makongeni, Botela, Ziwani, Jericho, and Jerusalem, among others. So why was it a popular pastime? It's because the areas of mentions are the ones in which uh, I'll say, the African workers resided. So the segregation of uh, residential areas, uh, so many Africans living in uh, Eastlands. And the city stadium is on the fringes of Kaloleni Estate, if you know uh, Jogorod, right? Okay, fine. So the problem was that it was a religion comprising two irreconcilable faiths, FC Lopards and Gormahia, split first by fanatical ethnic allegiance 
to team, and secondly, by the blunt instrument of hooliganism. But the most puzzling question is what might have led to the rise of hooliganism between FC Leopards and Gormaya fans. This question can be answered through a brief investigation of the social and economic background of the fans of FC Leopards and Gormaya, because football hooliganism is both relational and embedded within the collective ritual and group symbolism of each spectator culture. Now, uh, right from the be beginning of the Mashmaji Derby in 1968, Gormaya and FC Leopards clubs attracted fans of diverse social and economic status. So I want to first of all assess the social economic background of the fans uh, in an effort to uh, trace some of the motives behind the rise of hooliganism in football. So the most affluent fans were political leaders from Western and Luanyanza provinces. They patronized the ethnic football teams with an aim of galvanizing their political support. If maybe I can mention a few people like uh, the late Tom Boyer, of course, is the one who uh, organized the formation of Gorma itself. Uh, people like Job Omino, Martin Shikuku, among many others. So political leaders were some of the followers of these two teams, and they were using them to galvanize their political support. Now, the working class funds comprised Luo and Luya migrant workers in the public service and state parastatals. Uh, and some of them, of course, worked in the private sector. The low strata funds resided in the informal settlements within the Eastlands and in Kiber and Madari Valley slums, which were either walking distance or a short commute to the Nairobi city stadium. Most of them under living, working as casual laborers. Now, given the proximity of Nairobi city stadium to their residences, many fans attended football matches as weekend pastime, but it was not just the spectacle which drew hordes to the stadium. Football matches fulfilled other functional roles. The old generation of football fans in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, above all the low strata ones, were fresh migrant laborers from upcountry in pursuit of employment opportunities in the Bujoni Nairobi city. They were keen to uphold their traditions and practices, but the cosmopolitan environment of Nairobi had effectively shattered community spirit among migrant workers, smothering the individual sense of belonging to any uh, group greater than the family. Yet again, it was football that filled the void by providing a space for fans to express their cultural customs and traditions. This was evidenced by the pre-match and post-match rituals of FC Leopards and Gormaya fans based on their cultural customs. For example, fans habitually express their culture on match days by performing traditional songs and eating ethnic food, as well as taking traditional liquor. Over time, football events became a theater in which Luyas and Luos demonstrated and contested their cultural practices, sometimes in harsh terms, which partly led to the rise of hooliganism. I will qualify that at some point, all right? Uh, Weekend football matches created instant community on the terraces in which hundreds of people were all enthusiastic with a common interest of supporting their team on victory. So fans identified with their football clubs and a club's loss or win, a club's loss or win, uh, uh, meant a lot uh, to, the, to the fans. Uh, so, sorry, I was saying fans identified with their football clubs and a club's loss or win soon came to denote everything, particularly to a people born in a society which was by now starting to emphasize success. Now, every individual, regardless of their social status, endeavored to achieve some degree of success and recognition, either through sports, education, business, or politics. Having failed to achieve status through education and work, the low class fans, if I may call them, uh, both FC Leopards and Gormahia, attempted to gain status through football events. Expression of violent 
violent masculinity in form of physical fights and verbal abuses during football matches was a way through which some fans sought to gain status and recognition. As one respondent informed me, majority of radical fans worked the informal sector, mostly as casual laborers and artisans. They were the most passionate and often looked forward to attending matches on weekends as a way of decompressing work-related pressure and to express the freedom from the daily grind. They often made sacrifices to attend matches at the Nairobi City Stadium by trekking in bands as far as Madari, Karyubangi, and Kiberu, and using part of their mega wages to buy match tickets. Due to their passionate support for their teams, they did not hesitate to riot whenever they felt they lost unfairly. And uh, just maybe elaborate a little bit. So uh, from one of the interviews I did, the respondent told me that uh, those who worked in the informal sectors, they were very passionate about these matches. And if they lost after paying these tickets, especially if they felt they lost unfairly, they will feel like they've been robbed off their money. And so they will riot, right? Now, so I want to now talk about the issue of rivalry and development of hooliganism. Rivalry and the development of hooliganism. So football hooliganism between Gormai and FC Leopards is informed by the historical rivalry, which has created antagonistic relationship between their fans. According to one Ital, rivalry, rivalry creates a hostile interaction, which leads to the formation of in-group and out-group. Uh, among rivals of uh, sport fans. So rivalry creates a hostile interaction between uh, the between rival uh, sport fans. People identify with groups that enhance their self-esteem and public worth. Individuals also endeavor to see their in-groups look successful because they use them to express personal interests. Now, that argument is based on social identity theory. I quoted one tal and other proponents of the same. So uh, due to the feeling of in-group and out-group, then there is always that tense relationship between fans of these two clubs. Again, people will vary their relationships depending on perceived achievement and malfunction of the relevant in-group. When confronted with a rival outgroup, individuals are more sensitive to stress the positive features of the in-group, in most cases by highlighting the negative aspects of the outgroup. For instance, sports, sports, sport fans can highlight good features of their favorite club in comparison to those of the rival club. Indeed, FC Leopards and Gormaya clubs were formed to reinforce the rivalry between Luyas and Luos in football. Now, the, the rivalry between Luos and Luyas began uh, in football, rather, began during the colonial period when North and South Cavirondo teams uh, participated in annual tournaments, but it crystallized in the 1960s when there was a formation of the Kenya National Football League. And even to justify that in a better way, FC Leopards and Gormaya were formed because of that rivalry. Because in the early 1960s, you find that uh, Luyas had several small teams and the was the same. And because of this rivalry, they pulled talented players from these small teams to form two formidable football clubs, that is FC Leopards and Gormaya, to help them justify their strength in football. So you can see how the rivalry is developing there. Moreover, in the 1970s and 80s, 
both Gormahia and FC Leopards recruited most of their players from small clubs within their communities and a few players from Kamba, Kiku and Kisi communities. Now, due to rivalry, Luya players seldom played for Gormaria and vice versa. Any player who dared join a rival team was seen to be fighting against his community and was cursed and abused to an extent they could not play well. Therefore, the historical rivalry between Luos and Luyas in football is nested within their divergent ethnic traditions, which they use to justify the strength and success of their clubs. On the same note, they discredit their opponent's team by explaining their weaknesses from a cultural perspective in form of verbal abuses and gestures, as illustrated by the following observation of a former Gormaya player. When I was playing for Gormaya in the 1980s and 90s, we didn't want to be joined by Luya players because we believed they were eating in quotes chicken and bread and we encouraged them to stay in their own Luya teams. On the other hand, Luyas believed Luos were children because they were not circumcised and expressed this feeling through scissoring gestures by holding up the index finger and the middle finger on one hand in the shape of a V while keeping the palm turned down, something like this. Now, if, uh, let me go ahead. These derogative barbs were often traded between Gormahia and FC Leopard fans, either before, during, or after match, and often escalated into physical violence. One thing I found interesting, when I was interviewing those people affiliated to FC Leopards and I was asking them, what is the nature of this rivalry? And, uh, uh, they were dodging that question. They didn't want to say, no, this is something which began a long time ago. Don't worry about it. They didn't want to tell me this. So I got this from a Gormahia player. I don't want to illustrate how the reason why he had to tell me this. Anyway, so that's the real thing. They don't want to talk about it, but they say there's something that uh, started a long time ago by our four our old people. All right. So these derogative verbs were often traded between Gormahia and FC Lopan fans, either before, during, or after much and often escalated into physical violence. For example, whenever FC Leopard fans won a match, they would jeer their opponents by telling them that you children cannot win because you are playing with adults. We are teaching you football and you will only win if you become adults by undergoing similar rites of passage to, adult, to adulthood like ours. On the other hand, if Gormaya won a match, they mock the rivals by telling them that you people stop playing football because we are beating you every day since you eat chicken, in quotes. It's up to you to interpret that, uh, what that means. Uh, if you want me, I'll tell you, but that means something uh, quite obnoxious, but uh, so I've packaged it that way. That's the, that's the, that's the reality, that, that's the issue. That's the foundation of the rivalry and the hooliganism. Now, this covert antagonism sometimes escalated into physical violence by one or more precipitate elements directly related to the game at hand. It could be a controversial refereeing decision, mainly if it confirmed as a general perception that the referee was in any way favoring a given team or the exaggerated and provocative pantomime anger of a losing coach or fans. All right. Uh, in other words, when a widespread belief has crystallized around a precipitating incident or series of incidents, the mobilization of the participants for action begins. In others, it is simply a spontaneous avalanche of spectators onto the field headed for the referee, the players or the police. Now, that's one aspect of the rivalry. The second aspect of the rivalry uh, is in terms of competition to win the Kenya National Football League uh, Cup. So when I was talking about the ethnic dimension of the rivalry, it was about lawyers and lawyers, each of them wanting to be seen to be the best in football. But beyond that ethnic dimension, there's also the element of wanting to go home with the cup. So the competition to win the Kenya National Football League is the second aspect of the historical rivalry between Gormaya and FC Leopards. In the 1970s, what football did to the ethnic tensions 
between lawyers and laws to make them degenerate into physical fights during matches rather than at music concerts or movie theaters was to stretch them to the limits by adding victory to rivalry. Therefore, as football matches became a spectacle that catered for both participants and supporters, winning became more visibly important. Football clubs were seen as the face of the community and had to be defended by all means, including physical fighting. A loss of a match meant that meant many things beyond losing a trophy. It symbolically meant the entire community was weak socially, politically, and economically. In the 80s, 70s, and even 90s, it was common to hear fans expressing, expressing ethnic chauvinism uh, through success in football by saying, I am a strong lawyer or law because of the good performance of my club. Therefore, the fans' irresistible desire to win by all means often contributed to violence in matches featuring Gormaya and FC Lopez. In this case, football matches were used as a litmus test for the success of lawyer and law communities. For that reason, if either team won through a controversial goal, a fight was likely to ensue. All right. Uh, I want to go to the nature of hooliganism uh, between Gormaya and FC Lopez clubs. And uh, because of limited time, I'll go the thematic way. I want to go systematically uh, for my, uh, you know, that's how I have designed it. So nature of hooliganism. So uh, the way I've approached it uh, for this presentation particularly is in terms of, uh, you know, what are some of the patterns of hooliganism that you can uh, observe whenever these uh, teams play? Uh, now, the first one, most cases of hooliganism have been caused by contested refereeing decisions. Uh, there are cases in which referees are biased outrightly and that those in which fans misunderstand refereeing decisions due to ignorance of emerging football rules. So there's sometimes uh, the issue of misunderstanding but sometimes the referees are compromised. Uh, for example, in the 1968 Kenya National Football League, Abaluya Football and Faisal were involved in too much abandonments due to disputed refereeing decisions. Then, so I've mentioned the issue of referring, uh, contested refereeing as a trigger factor for hooliganism. Then, engineered pitch inversions engineered pitch inversions. So sometimes clubs stage manage pitch inversions in order to avert a potentially humiliating defeat. Now this is where we talk of organized hooliganism. Uh, in the theoretical framework, I did say that it can be spontaneous or organized. So organized uh, hooliganism manifests itself in terms of premeditated uh, pitch inversions, whereby uh, a coach instructs his people or one of the supporters to just all of a sudden invade the pitch to disrupt the match. And then once they've disrupted the match, they can have another chance of playing. Now, interestingly, most of these pitch inversions occur in the second half when chances of winning are minimal. For example, several match abandonments occurred in 1993, and I've just randomly picked 1993. That's, we have tons of cases here. So, for example, several match abandonments occurred in 1993, football season, due to organized pitch inversions. The first one occurred on 1st May 1993, on the 82nd minute, when Gormaya realized that FC Leopards was going to win the match. Uh, sorry, uh, I beg your pardon. No, in the, in the case of the first May 1993 match, it is Gormaya that was winning. So FC Leopards 
fans invaded the pitch to disrupt that match. And it, it, they did it on the 82nd minute. Then, still in the same season of 1993, the second league tournament between FC Leopards and Goromaya on 2nd October 1993 at the Nile Stadium was abandoned on the 71st minute. Uh, the Mombasa based referee, Suleiman Garib, was forced to call off the match when rowdy fans attacked anti riot police officers. Uh, the KFF, after conducting its investigations, found Gormaya culpable of hooliganism that disrupted the match. Again, the Moy Golden Cup quarter final match between Zoya Shug and Gormaya, held at the Nairobi City Stadium on 29th August 1998, was disrupted by the latter's hooligans five minutes to the final whistle when they sensed defeat since uh, Nzoya was leading two against goal zero. So fans of Gormaya who sat opposite the main stand threw missiles into the pitch, which forced Paul Okia, the match referee, to terminate the game. The hooligans not only damaged property and injured many innocent spectators, but also assaulted Gormaya chairman Leslie Okudo and intimidated the players for you know, embarrassing them. Then another element is what you call post-match violence due to humiliating defeat. Post-match violence due to humiliating defeat. So due to fanatism, fans fail to accept a defeat. Hence they vent their anger by attacking people on the streets and damaging property. Something you must have seen or experienced on the streets. For instance, on 10th October, 1991, when Gormaya lost their Moy Day celebrations uh, cup tournament at the Nyaya National Stadium, Gormaya fans assaulted innocent people on the streets and pelted cars with stones during their procession from Nyaya Stadium to the city center. Again, the Kenyatta Day match between, uh, at Moy International Sports Center also ended in chaos when Gormaya lost the second match against FC Leopards by, uh, you know, Then uh, because of time, I'll move a little bit quickly. Now, another one is what you call hooliganism during celebration processions. So hooliganism during uh, celebration processions uh, occur when fans celebrate their win. And this is quite common with the Gormaya fans. Uh, it was a common trend in the eighties, especially among Gormaya fans. The land behind Nation House off Tomboya Street in Nairobi became a popular rendezvous arena for football fans, especially Gormaya ones. You know, opposite Koja, we have that old nation house there. So that's, it was a meeting point for a photograph session. You know, when they win, they want to uh, be noticed that they're, uh, you know, they're celebrating. For instance, on 1st May 1989, Gormaya fans streamed into the lane, chanting celebration songs after the team won the Labor Day Cup match against FC Leopards at the Nyao Stadium. The fans chanted, picture, picture, insisting to be photographed immediately. They became impatient and started hurling missiles on the first floor windows of the nation house. And uh, a nation correspondent, Waigwa Kiboi, was among the several workers who narrowly escaped injury when missiles were hurled through the broken window panes. A similar incident occurred on 3rd September 1988, in which Goromaya fans attacked a taxi driver, Francis Njoroge, and his passenger in front of Nation House on Tombaya Street. The chanting mob of hooligans were celebrating Goromaya 2-1 uh, win at the interclub match at the Nyao Stadium. They forced us to stop, and then they continued hitting the car with their hands and stones. My passenger was then forced out of the car, then robbed off his wallet containing 2,750 shillings, said Jaroge. Again, another element of hooliganism is in, in terms of rough play, you know, rough play. So in the early 80s, uh, every club worth its salt in the Kenya National Football League had learned to include at least one strong man in its starting lineup. Such players were to provide the defense, be it with a boot, elbow, or body. Uh, for example, on 30th August 1980, a match between FC Leopards and Kisumu Hotstars at the city stadium 
was disrupted when Washington Wabwire of the former team broke his leg due to a rough tackle by an opponent player. FC Leopard, FC Leopard's fans were grieved and started throwing missiles. Uh, a similar uh, a case, for example, took place in 1997 when Samuel Molo of the Kenya Breweries was suspended for three months following his misconduct during a friendly match between his team and FC Leopards at the Nyar Stadium. Omolo elbowed and kicked Banda Omar after the latter fouled him. Again, we also have attacks on uh, match officials to intimidate them. And uh, most of these intimidations occur in the first half of the game, you know, uh, from what I found out, right? So sometimes fans, uh, they can abuse the referees, you know, they can also maybe even physically assault them. Uh, again, we have cases of hooliganism due to safety lapses in uh, at match events. And City Stadium was notorious for this. Uh, City Stadium, when you look at its settings, there is that flyover on Jogoro just next to City Stadium. It's called Soweto in the uh, football jargon. And uh, some fans will actually watch uh, the game from the vantage points like that or just behind the fence. And if they felt the game was not running well, they could start throwing missiles into the pitch because they knew they could easily scamper to safety if police officers pursued them. Now, the worst uh, incident of hooliganism which happened in Kenyan history due to security and safety lapses was on uh, in 2010, in which five fans died during a stampede at Nyao Stadium because they became impatient to watch the match. And so they, because uh, there's only one exit that was used uh, to access the stadium, they became impatient. It was getting late, the match has started, some have tickets, some don't. So there was a serious stampede which killed people on that day uh, in 2010. Now, uh, I want to move to briefly about, I want to talk briefly about uh, the responses to hooliganism in football. And uh, I will go chronologically from the 70s up to the 2000s in a, a very quick way. Now, in the 70s, uh, my observation was that uh, uh, this is when Kenneth Matiba was the chairman of KFF. And when, when Matiba was the chairman of KFF, he was, there was another faction called uh, Kenya Football Association. So these two factions were competing to tap as many clubs as possible. So as much as Matiba made a great effort to streamline football, he was reluctant to blame fans for, sorry, to blame clubs for hooliganism. He instead blamed fans for being reckless during football events. So he never took uh, serious measures to condemn clubs. Matiba avoided condemning clubs for hooliganism. Now, in the 80s, for example, when Clement Gashanja, in 1983, Clement Gashanja became the KFF uh, chairman, and he took serious measures to deter hooliganism by imposing uh, penalties against clubs found uh, guilty of uh, hooliganism. For example, in 1983, he fined FC Leopards 29,000 and some hundreds uh, for hooliganism. He also, it is during the same period of 1983 that he took uh, a punitive action against uh, a well-renowned referee here, that should be uh, Ali Sungura, he was suspended for seven months for being biased. Now, in my, as I finish, I want to say that uh, 
the manner in which football hooliganism has been handled over the years has been dependent on the leadership of KFF of the day. Again, football hooliganism has persisted due to lack of uh, uh, preventive measures for hooliganism. Most of the efforts geared towards eradicating hooliganism are always reactionary in nature. Uh, like, you know, the typical one is whereby police officers lob tear gas into the terraces to scuttle uh, violence. And uh, in the 2000s, where now I see hefty penalties being uh, imposed on clubs, especially during the reign of Nick Mwendwa as the KFF uh, chairman, on, uh, is the one who has been taking serious measures to deal with hooliganism. I think I can leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wood, for that presentation. Uh, Wood's work is uh, based on his PhD thesis. So I believe that uh, the comments and suggestions will help him to make it better. Uh, in the history of football, Wood started by giving us a brief history of uh, football, which to him he traced to, to Europe. But um, to me, I would trace it to ancient Greek Greece. So to enrich your historical background to go to, you should look at what happened with football in ancient Greece. Because I believe even the time of Olympics is derived from the ancient Greeks. Uh, Ogutu said that football hooliganism began it came in the colonial period where regional uh, teams were being organized to play against one another. But this became more, hooligans became more in the 60s uh, when the Kenya Football, Kenya National Football League was formed and the, the formation of Gormahia and AFC. So those became the center, became the, the, the center for hooliganism vulcanism in the country. And what I also managed to gather from Mogutu is that football became an, uh, became an agent of expressing social culture, the culture, the people's culture. So in other words, it also became an agent of uh, ethnic tension in the country. What I also gathered from uh, Ugutu is that football can also be an agent of violence in a country, if I meant wrong. So I what I also want to ask Ugutu is that can, can football also act as an agent of national integration? So I didn't have much uh, to gather because most of what you were saying was just to, to add or to stress his points. So I'll call upon the audience, uh, those uh, on site and those uh, online to give their contributions and questions. So I'll call upon my colleague, uh, Ms. Tabitha, to conduct the, the next session. Okay, uh, thank you, Joseph, for that uh, presentation. It's uh, actually an eye opener. Uh, uh, maybe for some of us who are not fans of football, there is quite a lot that we have been able to learn from football, and especially on the origin of, of violence. Violence that is the order of the day, not only in Africa, but also in the West, especially when we have competing, competing teams. We see a lot of uh, issues of hooliganism. 
and we have been able to see uh, how they originated and how they have come up to up to, to, to where we are in, in developing nations. So I'll be opening up the forum for questions. I'll be starting with our on-site audience. I'll be taking, uh, I'll take uh, four, uh, four questions or probably five questions. And from there, we will be going to our online audience. I'd, uh, I'll be starting with myself, I'll, I'll ask a, a question. And this question that I'll be posing to, 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 to my colleague, uh, Joseph, it's the question, how can you be able to distinguish between football hooliganism and organized crime? Simply because after teams, maybe a particular team loses a match, you find that the, uh, the fans go out into the streets, they mug people, they break shops, they steal, or probably then they engage in other unruly behavior. Is, is there a difference between that? Football hooliganism and any form of organized crime. So that's the first question that probably you'll be answering. And, and after that, I want to take I, I, I want to take three or four questions. So I'll be giving a chance to Dr. Margaret, who will be starting. So I will start with Dr. Margaret in that order. I'll go to Professor Wahome. I'll be coming. You want to ask a question? I'll be coming to Ian, that is number three. Number four, I'll be coming to my chair, this is Dr. Obogi. And number five, I'll be going to, to, to uh, Mwalimu Wanyoike in that order. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ogutu, uh, for that very good presentation. And for those of us who are not very fanatical uh, fans, uh, we learn a lot. I think one is more of a comment. The other one is a small question. Uh, Ogutu, uh, by its very nature, football as a sport, uh, of course, appears to invite hooliganism wherever you find it. And uh, I think you emphasized that uh, it's in Europe, it's in the West, it's in Asia. And of course, it's driven by local circumstances a lot of uh, times. For example, we've had the race question, racial slurs uh, in football. So um, what is new in, in, in this study that you're undertaking at this very high uh, level? What is it that we can learn that, that is different? That's my first question. The second one, um, in Kenya, I do not think that football is an elitist sport. You can correct me if I'm wrong. And so um, I'd really like you to comment uh, to what extent does this speak to class differentiation in sports, right? The kind of hooliganism we see in football and the kind of fan base that you are talking about. Does it speak to, for example, sports and social behavior uh, in your view? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Um, my question is uh, very simple, given that you have also looked at literature from elsewhere. And I wanted to know uh, why, where we fail because it looks like uh, we have strategies, uh, we do try to resolve, but we still see the same problems in uh, the more developed countries. What, what brings out that similarity that uh, it erupts while probably should have been uh, uh, somehow known in advance? Why is it happening here and also happening in the West, like in UK? And what measures have they taken uh, different from us? Uh, you have said that the measures are usually haphazard. Uh, how are the measures elsewhere? And uh, has there been a systematic change from, from the times of KFL to now 
what would you say has changed? Um, probably there are new methods of uh, identifying some of those issues. Um, I would like to know whether there has been a change or the way it used to happen in 1960s is the same way today. And what should be done from your perspective? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your very good and interesting presentation. I have um, two questions I think also point to sort of comments in some way. And I think first one sort of touches upon what was just said in the last question. It is, um, I'm just interested in the sort of history of how hooliganism came about. And I know you touched upon this in your presentation, but for example, organized violence in football matches in the colonial period seems quite different to what we might characterize as hooliganism. So I've been interested in how that arose. And then going forward over time, what the relationship was, if any, between hooliganism in Kenya and elsewhere in the world, because, for example, it's very common in, as you touched upon, lots of other parts of um, Europe and North America, I suppose, more recently. Um, so I'd be very interested in, is there a relation there or is this a very Kenyan phenomena, in your um, opinion? And the second question would be, and I think this is a way perhaps this presentation could be broadened slightly, would be, you touched on those groups who attend football. And what about the groups who aren't involved in violence? How do they view this as a phenomena? And how do they sort of interact with it? Does it affect people who attended matches over time? Has it affected the composition? And also sort of in the Kenyan public consciousness, how is this reported and how do people um, engage with it who maybe aren't football fans or attendees? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ogutu, for the presentation. I, I came in a bit late, so I might have missed a bit of it. However, I... Okay. So, however, there's, there is, there's a section that you talked about response. You, you, you talked about the response to hooliganism by Matiba and Gachanja. And you stated that the two responded differently. Now I'm interested in why they responded differently to hooliganism. What were the circumstances? What was the context? What were the informing uh, practices that led to this? Thank you. Um, this is uh, very interesting, Joseph, uh, and it's something that many people were looking forward to, uh, football hooliganism. But as you spoke, um, I, I sort of felt like I covered my, uh, my face a bit, uh, because mine is actually a life of uh, a former football fanatic. I played a little bit, uh, but um, at some point in my life, I could actually kill for Shabana. It, it was that uh, 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 bad. Uh, that is in the, the mid-80s. Uh, for those of you who are old enough, uh, Professor Wahome, uh, Dr. Gache. I'm sure you remember the, the days of Mike Okoth, the goalkeeper of Shabana. Salim Mabruk, we used to call him Mosongo, Mosongo, which means a white person. He was uh, uh, Mwarabu. Sylvester Mageni, uh, you know, Willy Chirichir, Baba, uh, you know, uh, Omar Tigana, Henry Motego, who is my village mate, actually. Uh, you know, David Mbongi, no relative of mine. Uh, 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 you know, Moses Monari, uh, David Mbuna, Mzewa Kazi. Uh, you know, that is how close uh, we were uh, to football. And my, my question, Joseph, comes from there. Because um, in your presentation, and I think Dr. Gachia alluded to this, you, you, you seem to draw 
connections, uh, you know, of um, ethnicity, uh, you know, soccer, and uh, to some extent, community uh, politics. And you suggested at some stage, the way this manifested itself in the two clubs that you are focusing on was that each club recruited uh, its players from its own community. But the names that I've read from Shabana FC, in, um, you know, in Kenya, we can place them in different communities uh, if, if, if you are keen. Then um, why was Sabana providing a different situation from the ones you were describing? Uh, uh, you know, at the same time when Golmaya and FC were at their best, uh, you know, and Sab Shabana, just like Gore and FC was a community club. It seems to me like if your criteria of a community club is anything to go by, then Shabana did not qualify. But then the passion, the emotion uh, with which uh, we regarded Shabana as uh, a Kisi community club, it was the same like the one the Lewis did at Goldmeyer and the Lewis did to FC Lovers. So I don't know. Um, you, you might want to comment on that and uh, probably look for something else that contributes this passion, emotion, uh, uh, you know, in football. And that probably brings me to uh, my second small question. Y you know, is there something innately football that make it prone to hooliganism? The last one, a small one, is, um, uh, you know, whereas we appreciate that uh, soccer is a non-African sport, you know, from the narrative that uh, you give us. I, I was just wondering, um, were there any traceable, you know, contours of hooliganism in purely African traditional uh, sports? Uh, if you may enlighten us on that, uh, you know, it would be a very interesting comparison to do in your study uh, about... Um, a purely Western sport uh, adopted in this setting uh, and a purely African sport. Thank you. All right. Can I proceed? All right. Uh, thank you so much for those. Uh, Great questions. Uh, they're very informative. I'll, uh, I want to make an effort to respond to them adequately, uh, starting with uh, Ms. Tabitha's question on, is there any uh, link between football hooliganism and organized crime? Well, there is the element of what you call commoditization of hooliganism, in which uh, during this, uh, confrontations, some people uh, mug people or engage in, uh, you know, theft. So that has been the case. And uh, there's a respondent who told me that, that uh, people also participate in hooliganism with, uh, in an effort to also engage in ulterior activities like theft. And uh, the commoditization of hooliganism, uh, like for example, in Europe, is quite different in which uh, over time, uh, these people uh, were documenting their histories. They were tracking attention, being interviewed by people. That is quite distinct from what we see on the streets here. So there's that element. There's, the, there's, a, there's a link between hooliganism and, uh, and uh, organized crime. But I will not really use the word organized in this case, because if maybe I mark you when we demonstrate, how is that organized at the individual level? So it can be, you know, fine. Now to Dr. Gashi's question, I want to say, uh, you asked me whether, what is new? Football organism has been there over the years, but the new ideas I'm bringing here is what I may call the idiosyncrasy 
of hooliganism in the sense that every, uh, in every country, the nature of hooliganism is informed by different developments. Hooliganism, for example, in England, is informed by social classes to a large extent, is informed by racism, for example. That is not the case in Kenya, where we talk of uh, ethnic issues informing rivalry between uh, Luas and Luas in football. In South Africa, you can talk of apartheid, you know, as a, an idiosyncrasy of hooliganism. So what I'm trying to build in this case is to bring the unique element of hooliganism in Kenya by talking about the ethnicization of uh, hooliganism and the rivalry for that matter. Now, football, uh, right from the time it was introduced in Kenya during the colonial period by the missionaries uh, and uh, by the colonial elite, it was a game of the ordinary, what you call the Mwanainchi. And uh, th there is a whole chapter in which I've captured that. So it is a, an ordinary game, not an elite sport. What I did mention briefly was that even uh, African politicians patronize football events, of course, with politics in mind, by maybe supporting them, right? But the majority of hooligans, of course, were people in uh, the informal sector, the masses. It's a game for the masses. You cannot compare, for example, uh, actually in the colonial period, uh, the Nairobi club was for the elites, uh, Europeans, but those who worked as maybe, uh, you know, ordinary workers at Kenya Railways, they're the ones who are playing football. But the elite colonial uh, workers or uh, administrators, they were playing golf, cricket at the Nairobi club. Then you also have the, you know, the Parklands one for the Asians. Right uh, now, Professor Ome asked me about where do we fail now, and uh, when you look at uh, the responses to hooliganism in Kenya compared to Europe, in Europe, what they did in the 1880s. Actually, what I found interesting is that uh, when football hooliganism intensified in the 1980s, it was the same case in England. But what they did, they invested in technology, for example, surveillance cameras. Again, uh, they ensured that if you are a member of a club, you must have proper identification. And if you engage in hooliganism, then you'll not be allowed into the, uh, into the match venue. So they took very serious uh, systematic measures to deal with hooliganism, something which is lacking in the Kenyan case. And, uh, then you ask me uh, something about, uh, you know, the continuity of why do we still see even hooliganism, uh, some elements of it in Europe, even in Kenya. I want to say in a very simple way, so long as there is fanatism and rivalry in football, there will always be hooliganism, but it can be contained depending on the measures to contract it. Uh, Now, you did ask me a question uh, about if maybe, if I can remember well, if there were changes, if there are any changes between uh, hooliganism in the colonial period and uh, in the post-colonial period. Whether there has been any change in the kind of hooliganism that we're playing in the system, we're seeing that we see today. All right, all right. Well, it is, uh, it is more or less the same uh, in terms of how it unfolds. What I will say has changed, for example, is uh, with the advent of technology in the 21st century, we now have maybe online fanzines in which people can exchange, uh, you know, abusive words as fans. So uh, the, the new consumption patterns of football, people can now, uh, watch football in a restaurant and they start fighting there or, you know, things like that. Uh, actually, there's an article I read about the, the virtual hooligans now emerging. So those, in my view, are some of the emerging trends in our hooliganism. Uh,
Now, uh, which groups uh, responses to hooliganism? Now, how do people respond to hooliganism? Well, hooliganism has always been condemned uh, by the general public because of the destructive nature and people don't understand why people behave like that. Even myself, uh, from before I began this study, and I really didn't understand what was happening, but I came to understand that it is out of fanatism and rivalry that uh, people go to those extremes, all right? Uh, maybe if I didn't answer your question properly, I didn't get it clearly, but uh, privately you can maybe respond to it once more. Now, uh, to Malimu Wanyoika's question. Uh, she was asking me about uh, the varying responses to hooliganism by various uh, officials of the uh, Kenya Football Federation. And I would like to say that uh, uh, in, the, in the 1970s, uh, uh, Matiba demonstrated great commitment to streamline football in Kenya, and he has been applauded for that. However, he was also facing serious opposition from his competitors in the Kenya Football Association, right? So he was not uh, willing to directly attack clubs under KFF, uh, affiliated to KFF for hooliganism. Instead, he made a press condemnation of hooligans, but he didn't see the hand of clubs in hooliganism yet. They also had a role in it because engineered pitch inversions, for example, are done by uh, by, by the clubs, All right? Uh, then after when Gashanja came, uh, of course, before Gashanda, we had Chris Obure. Uh, he didn't do much to deal with football hooliganism. Uh, but when Clement Gashanja was elected in 1983 to lead KFF and his secretary general, Marlon Danga, they were very proactive in handling cases of hooliganism by punishing rogue referees, if I may call them, and uh, imposing fines on uh, clubs, especially Gormaya and FC Lopez. Then when Joe Bomino took over from Gashanja later, Joe Bomino's time, especially in the 90s, was riddled with uh, uh, what I would call, KFF was always accused of uh, double standards in dealing with hooliganism. And this, for the obvious reason, Job Obeno being affiliated to Luo uh, was always uh, being kind to Gormahia because he's a patron by extension. And this is something also I was told by the respondents that the reason why it's not very easy to handle hooliganism in Kenya is that you find that some people in KFF are also patrons of these clubs. So when you present a case there, they just ignore it. So you write a report that during this match, a referee was beaten, attacked. Then when it's when they go to the disciplinary case, they even know the culprits, but they said, I don't know him. I've not even seen that fan. You know, who did it? That's not even our fan. So they know the truth, but they don't want to deal with it. And actually, the reason why I want to believe hooliganism might be difficult to deal with is because, uh, as I've said, there is a symbiotic relationship between hooligans and clubs. So when, for example, there's an engineer, a successful pitch inversion, the hooligans go back to the officials and say, now give us something. We have saved you from humiliation, you know? So something like that. Then uh, the chair asked me about uh, uh, Shabana uh, fanatism. And then uh, now, why didn't Gormaya and FC Lopards recruit from each other's communities is because of, first of all, I'm talking about Mashemeji Derby. You know, Shabana FC is a village club, but these are city clubs which are called derbies. And where is Shabana in Kenyan football? Nowhere. So there's no element of, uh, of but you see how many matches they ever win. So there's nothing to show for it. So they can recruit anybody. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. That's my honest opinion, Chair. All right. Yeah. So, so it is because of that competition to win, which was always the case between Task FC, Gormahia, and uh, yes, those are the three dominant clubs in the Kenya League. Even today, it is either Task FC, 
Yeah, those ones are nowhere. It's like this other small political parties. All right? Good. Uh, why is football predisposed to hooliganism? It is, uh, maybe I can give a pedestrian answer because I'm not sure for now, but what I can say, football is predisposed to hooliganism because it's a game of the masses. And uh, the, the element of uh, social control is limited in football. When you go to golf, for example, look at the people who play golf down here. These are business uh, corporate leaders who are uh, having some controls, but uh, anybody watches football. And that's why I think the, the crowds also makes it predisposed to hooliganism. I think that's a better way of dealing with it. Uh, traceable countries of hooliganism in African traditional sport. Well, uh, that one I cannot give a, a straight jacket answer on uh, the elements of, I think maybe when you look at uh, traditional wrestling, I haven't done much uh, study to see how they, those kind of uh, games were played, whether there were some regulations, but of course there was the element of violence. It's just like in the ancient Greece that uh, Molimodeni was mentioning. You know, when we had gladiator fights, for example, in the ancient Rome, if you did not win, you could be thrown into the lion's den uh, for punishment, something like that. So anyway, any question again? Uh, I think I've tried to explain. Uh, Tabitha, there are people asking questions there. Yeah, we go online. <laughs> uh, uh, Joseph, you can have a seat. All right, fine. So we'll be going to the next round of questions, but first of all, we'll be going to our online audience. So do you have uh, anyone, anyone who's had, had this up so that we can give him or her a chance to ask the question? Mm, it seems there is no one, so we'll be going to the chat room. Yeah, there is uh, uh, David Masika. David Masika, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Tabitha and uh, Malimo Gutu for the, the, that very informative uh, presentation. Uh, I left earlier because I came to supervise an exam, uh, to invigilate an exam. Uh, first of all, I'm still laughing over Shabana being the village girl, maybe <laughs> a very funny one. But then my question is, uh, or my two questions will be, uh, Malimo Gutu, do you think uh, there is a link between football hooliganism, fanatism, hooliganism, and development of soccer? Why am I asking this? Because uh, you realize that at the peak of football hooliganism is when Kenyan clubs and so uh, Kenyan clubs literally brought international fame. I international fame like winning uh, Sekafa and all these other trophies. But then after President Moi stamped uh, against all these uh, hooliganism or ethnical, he called them ethnic clubs, then you realize that uh, we have never won a serious trophy. So is there a link between football, uh, fanatism, hooliganism with the development of soccer? And then the next question is, do you think the death of or the reduction of football hooliganism in 1990s, particularly when President Moi uh, stated that he did not want to have ethnic ethnical clubs. Do you think that is that that in one way contributed to ethnicized politics? Now that people did not have a clear place to vent uh, their, their affiliation, so they moved it to politics. Because we see that from 1990s we start experiencing ethnic clashes. Before that, we were having football hooliganism, and people were busy with the football. Thank you. Okay, Joseph, you can address uh, uh, Masika's question. 
then uh, let's go to the chat room so that we can be able to, to bring the questions together. So the first chat is going is, is coming from uh, Jerry Mohoro is asking whether the session is taped so that uh, she can be able to get uh, maybe uh, this presentation. It is so. If Jerry were interested, you can be able to to consult the, our Department of History and Archaeology, and you'll be able to get it. According to uh, again, uh, Geoffrey Sang, he's saying it's a good presentation uh, together with Mokaya Obane. Uh, Obane. And Geoffrey Sang is asking, it's a comment, football hooliganism has complex origins that in four various cultural and social factors. You have rightly identified ethnic, that is what is calling group identity, a desire to conform social disadvantages, a perennial sense of alienation and marginalization, poverty and unemployment, peer pressure, fueling aggressive behavior. He is asking this question. I did not hear you here. You mentioned the role of alcohol and substance abuse, uh, sensational reporting, uh, as well as media hyper, political referee, uh, as, as high stakeholders associated, as well as uh, high stakes associated with betting at betting farms in the role of uh, football hooliganism. Jerry Mohoro is asking, can you elaborate on the minimalist approach in your study? Kamau, Dennis Kamau, he's saying that the presentation was awesome. It's an amazing topic. And he's saying, in your opinion, do you believe that this whole organism will stop or will it be passed over to the new strong upcoming teams like Vika United and Leopards? In your opinion, are these other teams prone to hooliganism in the future? Another question coming from Kiprotich Abrus. His question is based on the ethnic dimension as a cause of the football hooligan hooliganism. Can this be handled or controlled? The question is coming from Kiprotich. He's asking, uh, my question is based on the ethnic dimension as a cause of the football hooliganism. How can this be handled or controlled? The next question is coming from Mokaya Obane. He is asking, what about myth and beliefs among football fans in relation to the clubs in question? For instance, the 2010 game you have mentioned at Nyao Stadium, where some fans believed that entering the stadium through a certain gate will enhance chances of winning for their club, and this could, lead, uh, this could have caused stampede. Of latter, Gol Mahia at the FC Leopards fans normally assemble at Tom Boyer Stadium at Kencom stage, respectively, for what could be seen as is is a prayers in quotes for their teams, and this is where hooliganism starts. He's saying, uh, please uh, address that. Uh, I, I, again, uh, Helen Maula is saying it, it was a good presentation. I was lucky to be afraid of one of the greatest footballers in the Mashemeji Dabe. This is Joe Kadege, whom the city stadium has been named after. So I think it's the Joe Kadog, Kadege Nampira. Kadege Nampira. Did you interview any of the players to get, the, uh, to get their views of the hooliganism? How did you select the target population of your study? And what data collection instruments did you use? Uh, Mokaya Obana is coming back and he's saying is that he's tempted to look, to, uh, to look for you privately. Maybe he's your friend. And extend our hooliganism for calling Shabana as village football club. I, I, think, I think you know uh, uh, Mokaya, so you are going to meet and now address why you are calling Shabana a, 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 a village club. Uh, simply because uh, Shabana F FC had produced mighty uh, 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 footballers like Ende Motego, 
Michael Koth, Henry Nyadoro, and many more as the chair had mentioned. Mary Mukali is saying that the topic is interesting and great, it was a, it was a great presentation. Araka Dismas is saying, thought-provoking and informative presentation. According to Shipton, he is saying that, thank you for this interesting and informative presentation. Is there any way to explain why Luo and Luia Raifari became so prominent in football? when other ethnic rifaries were more prominent in, uh, in other contexts in Kenya outside of sports. So uh, uh, Joseph, uh, you can be able, we have another one. Yes, we have Daniel Okiro. It, he's saying that it was a good presentation from criminological perspective. It is the role of the police to ensure and enhance controls is this the case? Is hooliganism too much to be tamed? Or is it the state that has not done enough? I think it seems as if uh, uh, Joseph's, your presentation has, has uh, 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 a lot of, many people are so much interested in it and that's why we are having quite a lot of, 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 of questions from our online viewers. So kindly address that. All right, uh, thank you once more for the questions. Uh, I'll start with uh, Moliu Masika's uh, two questions. He did ask him about the link between hooliganism and uh, development of soccer. Now, uh, in the 80s, hooliganism uh, was prevalent because of that heightened competition between uh, lawyers and lawyers in football. That is FC Leopards and Gormaya, and even with the other uh, teams like uh, Tasca. Uh, then I think there's a question he was asking me about Moy's attempt to de-ethnicize football. And this is something that happened as early as 1969, uh, when Matiba uh, made an attempt to professionalize football in Kenya. But both of them failed to delink football from the tribe. What happened was that uh, when Moy uh, after 1982 coup, uh, pounced on these, uh, let me use, uh, maybe I'll uh, uh, call for the uh, disbandment of uh, ethnic associations. They simply rebranded. They simply rebranded, uh, whereby we now have uh, Abaluya FC, Abaluya FC becoming FC Leopards and Gormaya now calling itself golf, uh, golf uh, football club, right? So they didn't manage to really de-link de uh, football from the tribe, right? Uh, so in, the, in this case, I can say that uh, in, man, in answering Molimu Masika's case, uh, in my view, what, football, what hooliganism has done is to make this football teams, as much as they're doing well in the Premier League, they cannot attract stable uh, sponsors because of their tainted image. Uh, you know, when you're using uh, sport to promote your products as a company, you want them to demonstrate good sportsmanship beyond just winning the cup because people identify with uh, professionalism, all right? Now, then uh, Sang asked me about uh, group identity, alcohol, abuse. Why I didn't talk about them? Uh, well, the, the issue of alcohol abuse and uh, the other issues Sang mentioned, they also contribute to hooliganism. Drug abuse and hooliganism uh, contribute to hooliganism, but they are not the antecedents. Like I can drink and I don't abuse you. But if I have an issue, I can abuse you if I'm drunk, you know? So really, that's not really the origins of hooliganism in my view, but they contribute, yes, I agree. Uh, then Mohoro asked me about minimalist approach to uh, uh, hooliganism. I don't know really what that meant, I can't respond to that. 
Will hooliganism stop? Somebody asked me. Uh, I'm a historian, I'm not a, a prophet, so I can't answer that. Because I'm dealing with the history and I don't want to be speculative about the future. That's my best response. All right. Uh, Kipro teach, uh, delinking football from the tribe. Um, Now, the myths and beliefs of, uh, you know, somebody asked me a question about what happened in 2010. What I can say is that uh, it was not about people trying to access uh, the stadium uh, in a way that will make their teams win. No, what happened was that uh, there were delays in clearance of spectators to enter the new stadium. And so they actually uh, uprooted the gate and stormed the venue. And so in that process, some people were hurt. Some people are actually stepped on and they, 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 they succumb to the injuries. That's what happened. Uh, now, somebody asked if I did interview Kadenge. I did interview Kadenge, but uh, briefly in, in 2017, uh, at, you know, in South Bay. Uh, so, uh, my target uh, respondents were former current football players, uh, the fans of these two clubs, you know, uh, and uh, I actually interviewed uh, football, former footballers of FC Leopards and Gormania, those who are in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And uh, it is still work in progress. There are some uh, aspects that I'm still working on. So I've not exhausted it yet. Uh, data instruments. I mainly used open uh, uh, ended questionnaires to facilitate my data collection. Like I would simply ask somebody, uh, how did hooliganism uh, begin? Or what is the nature of the rivalry between these two clubs, for example? Right? Uh, I think maybe I can stop at that point. I, I couldn't really get the questions clearly. There's somebody with a burning question, if you can allow me, just ask, please. There's one I thought was important uh, that was asked by Professor Parker Shinton. All right. Uh, about, uh, you know, why the you and Luya are prone to football library compared to other, uh, compared to other ethnic groups. Uh, that compete in other contexts in, in, in Kenya, in politics and many other places. Why are the lawyers and lawyers particularly, uh, uh, if I may use that, crazy uh, about football and fighting over it? Th that is paraphrasing Professor Parker Shimpton's uh, question. All right, thank you. Uh, that's a very interesting question, of course. Uh, right from the colonial period, you find that uh, various communities identified with the uh, different sports. For example, uh, you find that Luos, Luyas, and uh, the Agiriyama uh, identified with football. Uh, in Rift Valley, uh, uh, the Kalenjin community, of course, uh, maintained the athletic tradition, even in the post-colonial period. But why do Luos and Luyas uh, uh, identify with football? Uh, Most of the, uh, like for example, now in the case of Lewis and Lewis, you find that uh, in the post-colonial period, they became immigrant workers in the Nairobi uh, city. And uh, football grounds, like for example, the city stadium was created for Africans as a recreational ground. And so it is uh, in this context that you find that people uh, gathering around football events as part of, uh, you know, celebrating their cultural uh, values and uh, practices. Uh, right? Anyone? Maybe okay. lastly, if you can allow uh, it. Joseph, uh, you can have a seat. Probably if there's a burning question with... Uh, yeah. So, uh, we can go online. There is one, 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 one uh, that is a student here. 
Bruno Msioki. Yoki. Bruno, you had this up. You can go ahead and ask, uh, and ask you a question. Thank you, Madam. As you've said, my name is Bruno Musioki. Uh, thank you, Madimo, for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, I have a question uh, on uh, social class. Uh, can it be a factor to be considered uh, as a factor to be considered when we talk of organism, organism, especially to the funds? Uh, uh, because in most cases you find that after the game, most of those funds who are involved in organism uh, may be co composed of middle class and low class earners. So can it be a factor to be considered in matters concerning hooliganism? And then the second one is uh, uh, an input on, uh, there is a question which Malimo asks that how to distinguish, how do you distinguish football hooliganism and organized crime? My take would be, uh, Polyganism, to me, I view it as more of a crowd behavior, whereby when we enter into football, we don't know the outcome. And maybe the, from the outcome, emotions arise. And then from there, people organize themselves and then they, they in, uh, involve themselves into polyganism. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Musioki, for that, uh, for, for your questions and comment. At, at least you have answered the, the question that I had asked my, 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 my colleague, uh, Joseph. And again, I don't know whether we have left anybody, anybody on, uh, online. We don't have anybody on board. I'll be, I'll be going back to the on-site. On-site, we can take at least three questions before we close. So I'll be starting with that gentleman, followed by, you'll be the second person, any other person? And from there, we'll be closing. All right, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mushoki, for your presentation. So I came in late, but I have a question. I have only one question for you. Like, how has the social media influence or speak to your subject, that is hooliganism? Are we, are we moving from like, from the pitch to social media. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gutu. My after questions. One is those people participated in those organism activity, sit a form of extended leisure because they have gone to watch a football match. Then after they have been disappointed, therefore they have to engage in uh, organism so that they can be able to feel good. That's one. Number two, this issue of um, black magic in football, where you find that uh, one team says that somebody has gone to a uh, witch to come with a kamote, and then they put in the post. Can that be a fact also which contributed through organism, especially the uh, pitch invention, where you find that now, they are failed to score because of black magic. What they do is to invade the, the pitch so that they can be able to disrupt the match so that they don't lose. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. We don't want to lock anyone out. I can see Muniyu uh, Kinudia. Muniyu Kinudia, our online audience. Muniyu, can I ask you a question? Thank you very much. Now, uh, Molimu uh, Ogutu, uh, Ogutu. Uh, the scene is revaluating archaeological knowledge, the minimalist stage, the regeneration of society in Kenya. Would you kindly link your topic to the theme? That is one. Two, uh, we've had uh, issues of uh, match fixing. Is a hooligan, uh, uh, how can we, can uh, match fixing be addressed by issues to do with hooliganism? Okay, okay. 
All right, we have uh, uh, our colleague, David Masika. Masika, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you once again, uh, Malim Tabitha. Uh, Malim Ogutu, uh, um, I did not hear you say something about uh, songs and hooliganism. Because uh, looking at the AFC Leopard, let me take it from the AFC Leopard uh, point of view. Anytime they were going to the stadia to play soccer, the songs that were being sung were actually war songs. It's like they were going to war. It's like uh, they would say, you don't touch a lady, you sleep outside there, you don't go. Ca can you please say something about the songs that were being used, uh, that, that, that were being sung during that, uh, those soccer matches? Uh, because they, they quitted to war. Why war? Why were they war songs? Have you come across something like that in your interviews? Thank you. Okay, David, you can go ahead and address the questions. All right. Uh, okay, fine. Now, uh, thank you again uh, for those questions. Uh, uh, Musiki did talk about, uh, can we talk of social class and hooliganism? Yes, of course. Most of the people who participate uh, in hooliganism seem to come from the low class in the society. And uh, I think your second uh, response, I mean, question was more of a comment uh, based on what Mali Mutawit asked me about hooliganism and organized crime. So actually I adopt the same uh, position with you, Musioki, that, uh, you know, organized crime is different from hooliganism. But uh, what I did say is that hooliganism can also, uh, be used as an opportunity for people to engage in theft or uh, uh, thuggery, for, for example. Now, then there is a question on social media and hooliganism. Yes, due to the uh, risks of watching football, uh, uh, of watching football in the stadium, you find that uh, some fans are now uh, shying away from going to the stadium, but instead they engage in online hooliganism, which I did talk about at some point. Maybe you came in late. So yes, there is a link between social media and hooliganism. And now fans are using social media to even organize for this kind of attacks physically, right? Uh, you know, we have what you call fan clubs. Like we have the ones in Eastlands, in Kibera, even in CBD around, there's one for the CBD and so on. Uh, then there's a very interesting question on the black magic and hooliganism. And then, uh, and no, sorry, before I go to that, extended leisure match. Now, you did ask me about that. Hooliganism is also uh, conducted for entertainment. Fans sometimes attack the opponents, and even in Europe, just uh, not really to hurt them so much, but to just intimidate them. And when you beat your opponent, there is that sense of catharsis, of feeling that you've conquered them, you've beaten them, you know? So some people also do it for entertainment, right? So the catharsis of attacking your opponent physically, right? Then you talk about black magic. The issues of black magic, now I will talk about maybe in future when I'll be talking about rivalry. It is the rivalry that make people go to the extent of using magic. So magic should, or witchcraft, which I'll maybe in future talk about in football is in terms of rivalry. Like if your business rivals, I can maybe consult widely to destabilize you, isn't it? Yeah, all right. Uh, then uh, the same question to Malimu Masikas, uh, the issue of war songs. You know, there's what you call preparations for war. And uh, even that's what I was told by the respondents. When they prepare for war, there's a way by which even they approach the stadium. There's a way, uh, there are some things that must be done in order, what they call uh, the research department. So. Again, that fits under rivalry, which I'll talk about in future. The issues of war songs, uh, you know, all those kind of things. Uh, and then the chair lastly wanted to respond to Kinuthia's question on uh, uh, linking my topic and uh, the wider uh, umbrella uh, theme. <laughs> yes. All right, fine. Okay, uh, thanks so much, uh, Joseph, for your presentation on hooliganism in football. 
Now this marks the end of our seminar presentations for this semester. I'd have been fighting our chair of our department, this is Dr. Kenneth Obogi, to be able to give a photo of banks and also address the question that was asked by, Ken, uh, by Kenodia. Thank you. Um, uh, friends, as uh, my colleague uh, Tapita said, today's seminar is the last one in uh, our January, May semester seminar series that uh, we themed the evaluating uh, archeological knowledge, the minimalist uh, state and the regeneration of society. Th that's our broad theme, uh, Kenuthia. That was our broad theme. And under this broad theme, we have had presentations that have touched in those uh, broad areas, the evaluating archeological knowledge. Uh, we, in fact, our past, past, very first presentation was actually on the role of archeology span in Kenya today. Uh, our second uh, presentation was re-examining of the settler state and colonial mobility in Kenya. That had issues, uh, how transport regenerated uh, society and uh, put us on a path uh, that uh, transformed uh, Kenya from uh, a basically traditional economy uh, into uh, a colonial economy that was uh, partially based in, uh, on agriculture. Uh, and then it improved the transport from the railway uh, to car transport. If you were here, you listened to that. Uh, and then there was presentations that touched on uh, the minimalist uh, state, the declining uh, hegemonic influence of the Kenyan state, uh, which could make it possible to be challenged by Mau Mau and, and many other movements. That's, that's what we meant. Uh, that was our broad theme, and under it, we had sub-themes. The theme we had today will more or less fall under the regeneration of, uh, of, of society through sport and leisure, uh, where we were looking at um, uh, hooliganism. Uh, I think there was a small confusion on that. Uh, so mine is just to thank everybody. Uh, we have come a long way from January up to now. And uh, we want to thank our online um, uh, audience. We have had very faithful friends who have kept with us. Uh, Dr. Biero from Moore University, uh, Professor Parker Shimpton, uh, Professor uh, Susan Amula, and many others from abroad who have always made a point uh, to join us online. Uh, I want to thank our on-site audience, uh, our members of staff, uh, that's my colleagues from the department who have, despite a lot of work to do and engagements in and out of the university, you have always uh, attended uh, these meetings. Our students, uh, you know, both uh, uh, the postgraduates and the undergraduates uh, who have kept coming and making sure that um, uh, we, we are there for these uh, programs. Our friends from abroad, I've mentioned our friends from local universities and many other uh, uh, places who have joined this. And, and interestingly, uh, uh, and I'm saying this is interesting, members of my own uh, church here in Nairobi, in fact, many of them have been very faithful uh, to this uh, seminar. And the young men who cover uh, this program record it and uh, help us to upload it on online, they are actually from uh, SDA Church Karangata here in Nairobi. Uh, so we want to thank you, uh, Isaiah, and your friend, and many of other of your friends who have come along and helped us to, to record uh, uh, that. And I think uh, when the history of this seminar series will finally be written in the future, uh, there will be a line about uh, uh, SDA Church Karangata, I'm very sure, uh, because of that contribution. Uh, we, we are in the business of trying to make history public. Uh, you know, when you find non-historians, uh, people who are not in the academy are, are attending uh, some of these seminars, we are in the process of demystifying uh, the academy and also demystifying uh, historical and archaeological scholarship. Uh, in fact, um, our next series, which begins in September, when we start a new semester, 
we have themed it uh, bringing down history from the ivory tower. And uh, this is uh, deliberate uh, because we have we will have presentations uh, that will bring on this podium non historians, uh, storytellers. In fact, uh, uh, my very good friend Grace Wangoi uh, will be performing. It's a storyteller who will be performing uh, 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 history in the actual sense of uh, acting uh, certain historical scenes. Uh, we have uh, my very good friend from Kodesia, uh, Mshai Mwangola, uh, who is going to bring in, she's not a historian, she's going to bring in something totally different. We have Mr. Gada, uh, who is going to talk about alternative history, uh, 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 you, you know. And uh, Ian will be here uh, in, uh, in October uh, when he comes back from Warwick. He's one of our speakers. And uh, Ogutu is coming back again for those who want to get more about uh, football hooliganism. Ogutu is one of the presenters uh, next uh, uh, semester. And uh, many others, we have also included some of our master students. Uh, uh, Mr. Mokaya is going to talk about albinism. Uh, uh, I, I don't know what kind of history would that be. Uh, but that is one way of uh, actually bringing down history from the ivory uh, tower and making a little bit sub uh, subalternist in a sense. I'm sure for the historians, you understand that. So thank you very much. And uh, we look forward uh, this coming week, we are going to circulate our flyer for the next series. So please, those who are in our emailing list, you will receive our flyer and we look forward to seeing you in September. Thank you and God bless you.